Well, I stand before you in a sort of a bittersweet state of affairs. This is uh, our last night together, and uh, I am sort of sad to see it all end. It's very sweet because I do get to go home and be with the best looking woman that God ever granted the earth to have. I get to see her and be with her. I get to uh, see my daughter and that kind of great stuff. But it's also sweet because I feel like we've done good things together this week. I feel like our time was well spent. And I've just been glad to be here. So glad to get to know you all. Um, Just feel like I've known some of you forever now. Especially Bill. I was... I was going to say, I've never heard Bill speak, and and by that I would mean preach. Then I thought, I could never accurately say I've never heard Bill speak, because that's what I've heard Bill doing, is speaking. (laughs) And uh, had never met Bill except talking on, on the phone, and then spending the week with him. I feel like we're just brothers from forever. There are just so many things that we have in common. There's so many ways in which we think alike. There's so many things we don't argue about. We love watching Jeopardy together. It's been fantastic. I love this guy. He's been great. He's been a terrific host. He's treated me much better than anybody who actually knows me would treat me. It's been really nice. And I want to tell you something. I, I don't know everything there is to know about Bill, but I can tell you that one of the highest compliments I could ever pay anybody, I'm going to pay to Bill White. He loves the people of this church like nothing else. He loves the people here and he loves the Lord with a strength and a fervor that is just impressive and inspiring. Nobody loves you more than Bill except the Lord himself. And you're, you're fortunate to have him. You're blessed to have him here. And he's blessed to have you. Let's make sure that's a two-way road. And it's been great to be with you. Thank you so much for everything you've fed me and all the pounds of weight that I've gained with you. I'll be able to be thinking about you all for a long time as I'm on the treadmill and as I'm eating the salad and all those kinds of things. It's been great. I also want to say, although I'm going to be talking for a minute or two tonight, what an, an absolute thrill it is to see these young people just packed in together, sitting together, being allowed to sit with them because I'm young too. Am I right? She's, so, she's like, oh, do I be honest or should I just? Because I know it's Friday night. And there are so many things you could be doing on a Friday night. Older people and younger people alike. You've chosen to go to church on Friday night. You're to be committed for that. You'll have my heart forever because of that. I appreciate you so much. And I want to talk tonight about some things I think that will be really, truly, genuinely helpful. If you want to, you can turn your Bibles to Romans 1. We'll be reading from Romans 1 in a little bit. But before I do that, I want to ask you a question. Do you know how to make a pickle? Pickles of these kind usually used to be cucumbers. They started life as cucumbers. And the way you make a pickle is you submerge the cucumber in a pickling potion, a brine. And that potion will be absorbed into that cucumber, and you can take that cucumber out after the uh, prescribed amount of time, and you can rinse it in water. In fact, you can soak it in water. You can leave it in water. But it will never, ever, ever, ever again just be a cucumber. Once it becomes a pickle, it's a pickle forever. It will never go back to being a cucumber. Does everybody understand that? Now, my wife likes to eat cucumbers that have been sliced and put in ice and a little bit of vinegar and water. See, that's still a a, a, that's still a cucumber. It tastes like a cucumber. It just got a little sort of zest to it. But that is a full blown pickle. You got to soak that stuff up. If you don't like pickles, what you think of is that's the perfectly awful ruin of a perfectly good cucumber. Our world 
is just this abysmal miasma of toxic things. And being in this world and being surrounded by this culture in our time has the potential to corrupt anybody who's in it, but especially young people. There's things, young people, you cannot unsee and things you cannot unhear and things you cannot undo. There are bells that cannot be unrung. Once you cross certain lines and you do certain things, you are forevermore on this side of innocence. No longer do you maintain the innocence of your childhood. Once you cross those lines, and this world wants desperately to pickle you in its potion. It wants you to be just like everybody else who's becoming a pickle in this world. And I'm going to tell you what this pickling potion consists of in our toxic culture. It goes back a little bit for us to 1953. Now let me just tell you about 1953. I wasn't alive then. Maybe if you want a first-hand account, you should talk to Bill. Anyway. <laughs> 1953, people slept in houses without their doors locked. We're almost everywhere. Little towns and big cities. In 1953, you could send your children out in the morning and say, go play and tell them to be home by a certain time. Supper's at 6. And never really worry about them the rest of the day. I remember even when I was a kid, growing up a few years after that, I had to be home when the street lights were coming on. Anybody else have that rule? Well, I, they could just turn us loose out there, couldn't they? And you'd have to worry about it. You could let your kids go to neighbor's houses and not think too much about it. It took a village to raise a child, didn't it? You got cousins, aunts, and uncles, and all these people living close together, and people who are in the small community. Everybody supported everybody. Everybody kind of loved everybody. It just was kind of a different world, wasn't it? 1953, though, is when Mr. Hugh Hefner comes out with Playboy magazine for the very first time. And it's not just a magazine, and he's really clear about this, it's a lifestyle. In 1953, in the United States of America, sex became a sport. Because of this. It stopped being an issue of married people and procreation and recreational marriage situation stuff. It started being a sport for single people or people in extramarital situations. It was a lifestyle. And he introduced that to us. And I'm going to tell you what, I don't even know that he could have imagined that we turn it into the professional sport that it is now. I mean, he started off this Bush League kind of little you know, kind of amateur triple-A ball team thing, and now we are NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball style sex as a sport. And today in our world, if you don't think of sex as a light thing, a small thing, a mild thing, and everybody does it thing, don't get too bent out of frame about it, don't get too excited over it, if that's not the way you think, not going to fit in. It's not a big deal. Does that sound familiar? In 1969, the Woodstock Music Festival, it's not the problem. Don't misunderstand me. But that's the moment. Right there is a moment when drugs inside that culture just became the norm in our society. That was a moment in time where the people who were taking drugs recreationally started making that a normal thing for young people to do. Before that, it was really odd. It was really unusual. If you found somebody who smoked marijuana, it was really kind of an unusual thing. There was even an, an old movie called Reefer Madness. And people make fun of that today. Because the idea was before that, that if you smoked reefer, if you smoked weed, if you were into the, the ganja or whatever you want to call that stuff, I know a lot of the words for it. Don't look at me like you're so surprised. I'm not that old. If you did that, you were in danger. See? Because it was the devil's weed. And now, in our world today, we're legalizing that stuff in lots of states because it's no different than alcohol, right? That's no big deal. 
Drugs became the norm about 1969, and so it just kind of became a, a part of our culture. And I'm going to tell you something. Most Americans today think that most teenagers will probably try drugs during their teen years, if not in high school, certainly in college. After all, that's what college is for, for experimenting, right? Isn't that what you've heard? That's what college is for. I don't know. I'm crazy. I'm old-fashioned. I thought college was for education, but whatever. Another event happens in 1969 that changed our culture for forever. The Manson family murders. Maybe you don't know much about this, but it was a super unusual series of events that happened on a few different nights where a crazy lunatic named Charles Manson who got a bunch of hippies to follow him around and listen to him like he's some sort of Messiah figure, he got those people to choose rather randomly some fairly wealthy people and murder them simply, simply because he thought that would be a good idea. Not because they had wronged him in any way. Not because they'd been involved in a business dealing that went bad for him. Not because any other thing other than he wanted to kind of ignite some kind of race war or some kind of cultural war that is the year, my friends, that violence became entertainment. So our culture in the middle of the last century started having sex as a sport, drugs as normal, and violence as entertainment. And I'm going to challenge you to find very many shows on TV or movies that are in the theaters that do not capitalize on one of those features. Or most of them. And now here we are. 2014. This stuff just rolls off our backs. Exposure to these things has us feeling like, you know, that's just the way it is. We don't think too much about it. Listen, I've played Call of Duty. I don't know how many people I've shot. But you know what it is? It's just a game, right? It's just a game. Is that right? Pretty realistic. It's it more and more realistic all the time. That little Playboy bunny thing now seems like such a mild thing to us, doesn't it? All the hardcore pornography and stuff that's out there. Playboy is... I've even heard them described as tasteful photographs. T tasteful. Those people have lost their sense of taste. This is the culture, young people, that seeks to pickle you. You are what they're looking for. They want you to be so immersed in this culture that you don't pay attention to the fact that things are changing in you that your attitude is changing, that your viewpoint has been altered, that your innocence is being lost, that your naivety is just blown to the wind, and that you're no longer the same and you will never be the same. Because they want you to look and sound and be just like them. And if they can get you in that long enough, you can never go back to just being a kid. You'll never be what you once were. So how is it that we got to this point. Well, friends, this is nothing new. Way back in the book of Judges, in two different places, in Judges 17, verse 6, and also in Judges 21 and verse 25, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. When you live in a world where everyone just determines for themselves what's right, and everybody just kind of makes that up inside their own mind, and they don't have any standard larger than themselves, this is the kind of world you get. This is the kind of stuff that happens when there is no king, when there's no one to answer to except for you. And you've heard this most of your life, most of you. Oh, well, you may think that, but I think this. That's your truth, but my truth is something else. That may be the way you see it, but my interpretation of it is this. Or I just don't see it that way. Has anyone heard that? Am I the only one who's heard this? Thank you. I hear that all the time. There's no such thing as an objective standard. There's no such thing as absolute truth. Have you heard that? If you haven't heard that, 
it's because you've not been on a college campus in the past 15 years. That is one of the number one things that they push right off the bat is that there is no such thing as an absolute standard. There's no absolute right, absolute wrong. And yet, they still teach math that operates strictly on that principle. There's only one right answer. They still teach chemistry and biochemistry and anatomy and physiology. And they will still mark your test wrong if you give the answer that they didn't want you to give. And if you come up and say, listen, there's no such thing as absolute right and wrong. They'll say, you're going to fail this class, you dummy. But when it comes to morals, when it comes to standards like this, they will agree with you. Now, how do we get to this point? There's no king. People have dethroned the Lord. This has happened in history. Romans 1. Our society is not unique in this way. People want freedom. And so what do they get? Anarchy. Anarchy. That's what freedom looks like, right? You can do what you want. I can do what I want. We're not going to have any rules. And yes, party time. Free love. And what is it? Chaos. That's all that ever is, is chaos. Romans, the first chapter, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world is invisible, attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals, and creeping things. And look what happens next. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen? For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men. Committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, Sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. That could have been written in an op-ed piece in 2014. Now, couldn't it? And where does it start? No standard. I'm not going to answer to anybody but my pleasure. I don't have to answer to anybody but my lover or my dealer. And if you don't like it, I can just take care of you. That's the world. That's what they want you to do. So how in the world are we going to keep from being pickled? All the way back in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is such a great tool given for our learning, Romans 15, 4 tells us, that we through the patience and the comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. But all through the Bible, we see the heroes of the Bible making mistakes, don't we? The Bible's very honest about the people who are in the Bible. Don't you notice that? 
Even the best people make mistakes. The good guys sometimes lie. They make mistakes and they sleep with people who aren't their spouses. There's, there's some pretty graphic, true stories that don't necessarily make these people look good. So what does God do all throughout the Bible? What God does is He teaches them how to remember things. There are big stacks of stones all over Palestine. If we can ever find all of them. That they're built for the very express purpose of reminding them of something that happened. There are altars where they're supposed to make these offerings. There are writings that they're supposed to read. The book of Deuteronomy is just full of these things. But in Deuteronomy 16, 16, we notice very specifically there are these three huge feasts that they're supposed to observe every year. Every male who's a Jew is required to attend these feasts to remember that God delivered them from their bondage God's tremendous support and care and all of His concern and that He cared for them in the time of their wilderness wandering. They're supposed to call those things to mind and every year they are supposed to remember. Things given to them to help them remember God. Regular, predictable reminders. The Apostle Peter felt like that wasn't just Old Testament people that that was true of. Remember when Peter's writing his epistle in 2 Peter, the first chapter? He says, I think it's right while I'm in this tent to do what? To remind you. Though you were established in the truth, and you've, I think it's right for me to remind you. So, do you think you need reminders? Have you ever forgotten to do a chore that you were supposed to do? I mean, genuinely forgotten, not said, oh, I forgot. <laughs> I didn't want to do it. <laughs> but really forgotten. Well, look, this is why we have this stuff. Write it down. Put it on the calendar. Put it on my phone. Put it in my day planner. Put it on my iPad. Put it on this thing here. Right in my palm. <laughs> this, by the way, I don't know if you kids know this, the original Palm Pilot right here. <laughs> Write stuff on my hand. And why do we need that stuff? Because we forget. Because no matter how hard you try, sometimes you just go, oh, I forgot. I forgot to do this. I forgot to do this. Oh, I meant to. Mm. I thought I, oh. We were supposed to. That ever happened to you guys? It gets worse when you get older. <laughs> much, much worse. Much, much worse. In fact, my wife tells me for every child you have, it takes part of your brain, about half. <laughs> I am so sorry, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> so the rest of our time, really what I want to spend our time doing, I want to talk about four things that God gives us to help us remember. These four things will help us get out of the pickling potion. Help us to remember who it is that God wants us to be. Number one is over here in the book of 2 Timothy. I want you to turn over there. I want you to read with me. I want you to pretend like you've never heard it before because it's just that important. Number one, God gives you a standard, young people, that you may trust, that you may consider as factual. In the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16, he says, All Scripture is inspired by God or given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Peter, the first chapter in verse 3, tells us that God's divine power is given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. This book, especially young people, I need you to know this. This book right here is constantly and more frequently in your time under attack. People don't want you to believe this book and they try to discredit it. 
This is what I want you to make a commitment to me about tonight. Are you listening to me? I don't want you to ever just take the criticism of this book from somebody who doesn't believe in it without considering what somebody who believes in it has to say about this book. I want you to give equal time. I don't want you to go to college. I don't want you to listen to a teacher. I don't want you to listen to a friend. I don't want you to listen to somebody who doesn't believe in this book, who says stupid things like, you know, there's 185,000 discrepancies in your Bible. I want you to say, show me one. And what's happening is they're parroting something they heard on the Discovery Channel. They've been watching too many documentaries. They've been listening to something. They're like, what? 185,000 indiscrepancies. What? It's not because they've made some super big study of this. And I can promise you, if you use the word textual criticism, they won't have any idea what you're talking about. They won't know what the, the manuscript evidence is. There are so many things. Please, please, young people... Before we leave tonight, if you're struggling with this, or if you even think you might struggle with this, you get my phone number. Give me equal time. And I promise you, no one will explain this better than someone who believes in it. This book enjoys more support than any other ancient document known to man by a factor of like 600. This book is absolutely... Without any doubt. No shadow of doubt whatsoever. These are just the words of God. And they're all the words that God wanted you to have. And when you read these words, you may assume God's talking straight to you. Without the filter of humans. That's what you may be assured of. And I can tell you, anybody who can make a case against it, I can make a case for it twice over. I used to wonder about it. I doubted it. I wasn't sure. I had to learn for myself. I had to go through that period of testing. And when I was finished, I was more convinced than ever that this is the Word of God. It is the unchanging, unalterable, absolute standard by which people must live. And it is the thing by which we will all be judged. Now let me tell you something about that. People say, well, you know, people don't want me told what to do. People don't... People don't want, you know, rule books. And they, just, they just don't want, you know, I start talking to people, they just don't want. You know what the two fastest growing religions in the world are? Islam and Mormonism. Nobody's more strict than those people. They got rules coming completely out of both ears. They don't even make sense. Don't tell me people aren't interested in having a standard. People are just like rivers. As long as they're within the banks of how they're supposed to flow, they're helpful. You can eat from them. You can drink from them. You can generate power from them. But as soon as that thing leaves the banks, leaves its appropriate boundaries, it becomes dangerous. Young people, that's what you are. You're a river. As long as you're within the banks, you're super useful, super helpful. But if you get outside the banks, you get outside the boundaries of what God has allowed you, you become dangerous to yourself and other people who are around you. You need something that is not the whims of humans, where this is moral one year and the next year it's not. This is right one decade and it's not right. You need something you can count on. Something you can bank on year after year after year, decade after decade, century after century. This is the only book that can be that. It's the only book that's ever told us where we've come from, why we're here, and where we're going. And if you can get your mind wrapped around that, you've got something. This will help you. God gave you this book to help you remember that. We've talked about this passage several times in the time that I've been here. Hebrews, the 10th chapter. I'm going to read verses 24 and 25. I've kind of quoted around it and danced all around it several times, but I'm going to read them. Because I think this is super important. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. He wants us to meet with each other. These weekly assemblies, Acts 20 and verse 7, very specifically indicates to us those Christians who are closest to Jesus, listen, listen to me, 
the people closest to Jesus, the people who had the apostles meeting with them, who had spiritual gifts, those people felt like they needed to meet at least weekly. I don't know what else to say. If you go to church with the Apostle Peter and you feel like you still need to come every week, what do you do when you go to church with someone like me? You probably need to go to church every day. Five days to fix all the stuff I screwed up on the other two days. That's what you probably need. These folks got together because it was beneficial to them. And let me tell you where it all happens. You're about to leave home and go to college and sometimes you feel like wings are literally about to pop out of your back as you get out from under mom and dad because these people have been ridiculous with their curfews, their rules and their restrictions and oh wow, here we go. And those wings go out the back of you and you go, oh I'm free and you just, you fly. And so you go to another city Maybe nobody knows you there. And you start looking for a church, or maybe mom and dad, they take you to the city, and there you are sitting in the church that they want you to go to while you're in You're like, oh, hi, how are you? How are you? How are you? And then mom and dad go home, and you oversleep one Sunday. And you're like, oh, that was pretty sweet. <laughs> I was really tired. And then you got a final, and you study, well, I was up late Saturday, and I didn't want to get up, and, and I really need to study some more. It's a big test on Monday. I, I, I'm not going to go. And then you just start choosing not to go. And before you know it, you don't want to go. You're not interested in going. And then you explain to people, I don't know, while I was in college, I just kind of lost my faith. What happens in those cases? Let me, let me enforce a little honesty. What happens in those cases is you got spiritually lazy. You didn't lose your faith. You threw it away. These assemblies right here, they are crucial to your development. And you're like, oh, you know, it's, some places just a bunch of old people and the singing's all... Hum, hum, hum. And the preacher says the same thing all the time, and I'm going to die if somebody reads 1 Corinthians 11 one more time at the Lord's Supper. I get it. The Apostle Paul says, don't you have houses to eat and drink? Oh, a worthy manner. Come on. And all of this stuff is going through your head, and what you're thinking is, I'm just not getting anything out of this. And I think we covered this a couple of days ago when I said the only reason anybody doesn't get anything out of an assembly of God's people is because they didn't put anything into it. It's not your mom and dad's church. It's your church. It's your faith. You've got to stake claim to it. And you've got to say, I'm going to do this for me. Not because mom and dad expect it. Not because my grandparents did it. Not because I'm Church of Christ. But because it's your faith. You think it's important. You want to go to heaven. You believe in God. You want to know if there is a God. You're exploring and discovering and learning for yourself because one of these days you're going to know. And I get this all the time. All the time. People who stop going to school and college and then they get married and all of a sudden they're interested in going to church and they go, you know what I realized when I was a kid growing up in the church, I really didn't pay attention. I don't really know anything. And we've got to start all over when they're in their early 20s. Or someone who didn't pay any attention through all of that, didn't go during the college, and then they have a baby. And all of a sudden they're like, I'm responsible for a complete human being. <laughs> and so they want to come to church. And then they realize, you know, when I was in church as a kid, I didn't pay attention. I went through every grade of school going to Bible class and filling out blanks and doing all that kind of stuff and I don't know any more about the Bible than my cat does. <laughs> and do you know why that is? It's because it wasn't your assembly. It wasn't your faith. It's got to be yours. And if you're having trouble dealing with that, if you're having trouble coming to grips with that, get some help. There's help to be had. People want you. 
to develop your own faith, not to just adopt theirs. And if it's a little different, walk through it, talk through it. But absolutely, you've got to get it figured out. On the first day of the week, when we take the Lord's Supper, that, my friends, is an anchoring point to keep you humble and mindful. No matter what you did through the course of the week, Jesus loved you even through it, and He'll love you in spite of it, and He wants you to get back on the horse if you fell off. A week should never pass without you taking the blood and the body of Christ. And remember, it was for you. Nails did not keep Jesus on the cross. His love for you kept Him on the cross. And that's what the Lord's Supper does every week. 1 Peter, the first chapter. Beginning in verse 18. There's a fact that's stated here that we must extrapolate to understand something else. Besides the fact that God gave us assemblies to help us remember, He also gave us brethren. And one of the passages that we get that from is this one here. 1 Peter 1, verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So what was it that saved us from our sins? It was the blood of Jesus Christ. If the blood of Jesus Christ saved me from my sins and the blood of Jesus Christ saves Him from His sins, then we have what in common? The blood of Jesus Christ. What is it that makes people family? How about that? So if He has blood in common with me, that makes us family. And if we're bound by the blood of Christ, we're going to be family forever. Forever. No matter what kind of relationship we have on the earth, that may end. Boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, child, parent. That ends on earth. But the blood bond with Jesus, that goes all the way up to the top. And these people were given to us to help us. To help remind us. So you know what Paul tells Titus to do? Paul tells Titus, he says, tell Bill... He needs to tell Alec about what's going on about being a man. Why? Because he's an older man. Tell Dorothy what she needs to be talking to Juliana about because this is what it means to be a wife and a mother and all of the things that pertain to being a Christian woman. Older people teaching younger people. And this is what I see in churches all over the place. Younger people doing this. And older people doing this. We're family. Doesn't work like that. You don't get to ignore family. Don't you wish you could sometimes? But you cannot ignore family. We're in this together. We're a family together. This is what families do. They help each other. And so when an older person comes to you, even if they're not being particularly sweet or tactful about it, you bend your ear and listen. Because all they want to do is help you. We have a guy at our church who is super crusty. I mean, he is sometimes classic curmudgeon. I mean, he's just... He just grumpy Gus sometimes, you know? But I tell you what I learned about that guy. He has never, he has never gotten on anybody's case. He's never tried to help me by showing me what was wrong with me. Never has he ever done that for any other reason than he loves me, than he loves them. He loves the Lord and he loves the church like everything. And that's what drives him to do the things to help people come up from where they are. That's what families do with each other. And if you're going to be the kind of person who is just super sensitive and people dare not criticize me and how dare you! You're making it hard to help you. And if you're 
immature compared to somebody else who's mature, what you need to do when they're saying something, hey, I've thought about something that you might need to think about. You need to shut up and be sweet. Be thankful. Just be thankful. You don't have to take everything somebody says to you, but you be thankful in the offering of that. And what it is that you learn, the fact that we all have the same blood means we all have the same Father. Ecclesiastes 12.1 is a classic example of a text for young people, isn't it? Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth. You notice how it's very specific in that passage? Your Creator. Not the old people's Creator. Your Creator. Your Father. And don't forget that in all of these things, you're going to be judged for what it is that you do. Speaking of which, one of the things God helps me with is the reminder that I'm going to be judged. 2 Corinthians 5th chapter, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. In Ecclesiastes, the 11th chapter, in verse 9, he tells young people, enjoy your youth. Lap it up. You know what? When you're young, you need to squeeze life until it's just dry. Just hug it. Oh, I just love living. Just get everything you can out of it. Because you'll only pass this way once. Your joints will only work like this one time. You will only recover from fatigue over athletic injury really fast one period of your life. That's it. You will only have puppy love once. You only get a pass for being young and dumb. One phase. That's it. When the gray hair starts showing up, people start expecting stuff of you. Just And dyeing your hair doesn't work, so don't get all smart. And uh, by the way, I don't know who's asking. This is natural. <laughs> There's gray in here. Remember, you believe in heaven and hell. I'm going to ask you young people to do me a favor. If you believe in heaven and hell, just raise your hand. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it with all my heart. Heaven and hell is a real thing. What's funny about this is when you do the research and you get all the polls down, never in the history of research has there ever been a number that's exactly the same. In America, always, somewhere between 5 and 17% people believe in heaven that don't believe in hell. I'm so confused about that. Because the same source book is where we get the information about both places. And if you believe in heaven, guess why you believe in it? Because the Bible talks about it. If you believe in heaven, you must, therefore, you've got to believe in hell. I believe in hell, and I don't think there's anything wrong with thinking about it once in a while, because not only do I not want to go there, I don't want anybody I know to go there. I don't want my enemies to go there. And if you think you want someone to go there, it's because you just don't understand it. It's horrifyingly bad stuff. It's the worst on, on a level that I just could not begin to use words to describe. This horrifying thing. If every day you remember, no matter what else I do in the earth, eternity may hang in the balance for the things that I do. That will help you make good decisions about not getting involved in the pickling potion of the world. These are the things God gives us. A standard these assemblies with our brethren, a family that loves us and should help take care of us, and consequences. If I can keep those four things close to my heart, I will be able to stay out of this pickling potion and I may just be able to be saved from all of that. Well, I told you I was going to talk to the parents. And I'm going to. Just hold your horses. Young people, some of you have come from lots of other places. I'm going to do something I bet you've never heard a preacher do. I want you all to work really hard to get each other's digits after church. Get them, get them phone numbers. 
Not for dating. Don't get so excited, Jared. Just calm down. <laughs> what I want is for you all, because some of you may go to a church where there's no one else your age. Or you may go to a church where there's not many people your age. Or you may go to a church where you find yourself being the only person of your age who's really interested in being faithful. I want you to have the phone number so you can text or you can Instagram or you can... I know Facebook is really for old people. I get that. But just in case, you still have a Facebook page. So that you can communicate with the people who are your age and say, hey... I'm struggling with this in school. I'm struggling with this with the people I go to school with or the people I'm around. I, I need you to tell me, how would you handle this situation? I want you all to use each other as a support group to help keep out of that pickling potion. Does that make sense to all you guys? So I really want you to do that. I want you to get some numbers and storm. And I don't want you guys to take advantage of that in a way that's inappropriate. Jared. Let me talk to you parents for a second. I'm exhausted and aggrieved, frustrated, and infuriated with parents who act like they can't do anything with their kids. <coughs> For those of you who have little ones, you get a hold of Johnny when he's down here or you will not have a chance of getting a hold of Johnny when he's up here. There is an order that must be observed. Parents are in charge. Children are not. The book of Proverbs says it over and over and over again. One of my favorite passages from Proverbs is the one that says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. It is your job to do whatever it takes to get in the way. Because the culture is riding hard to get to these people. They are pushing on every corner and they're using every outlet, including all the social media and every form of entertainment. They're using everything at their fingertips. And they have resources that the church will never be able to touch financially. So it is the front line of defense that makes all the difference. I see people who let their children go to school dances dressed as prostitutes. And they say, well... You know, we just let her make the decision. We just hope she makes good decisions. And so, she didn't, but, you know, we're disappointed, of course. But. I don't care if you like it or not. I told my kids when they were young, I will chain you to a pole in the basement before I let you go out into the society as some kind of wreck. I will not see you ruin yourself or be a danger to other people. I don't care if you don't succeed in anything else. As long as you go to heaven, I've done my job. And until parents see that as their number one obligation, they will fail repeatedly in so many different kind of ways. People who have their kids stay home and do homework instead of going to Bible class. People who let their kids go to sports practices and join traveling leagues so they miss the services of the saints all the time. People who do all of those kinds of things and then their kids go to college and they're like, I don't know what happened. Don't play coy with me. Don't be stupid. You need to go to bed exhausted every night. Not from being on Facebook and checking your old friends, but by watching these people and doing whatever you've got to do to keep them out of that. And once you've done that, that's all you can do. But don't come to me. Don't come to Bill. Don't go to your elders. Don't go any other place and say, I just don't know what happened. 
when you haven't put the Lord first in their lives. They've got to see it. When the boy comes to the door and wants to take your daughter out, and he looks and smells like he came from a marijuana convention, that boy's got about five seconds to get off my porch. Some boy pulls up in the driveway driving a van with no windows in the back of it. He will just have to back that thing out and keep on moving. Some girl shows up with my son somewhere and she's got a skirt up here and everybody in the world can see what God brought her. That girl had better leave my boy alone. And I'm going to say it. You dress like a streetwalker. What are you doing with my good boy? Do your parents not love you? Or did you sneak out and put on something after you left? Because, wow. Wow. That's gross. Will you say that? Or just pick whatever the scenario is. You've got to get in the way. That's your job. If you're not willing to do that, you do whatever it takes to prevent yourself from reproducing. How about that? Can we just have that deal? Parenting is not for wimps. It's just not for sissies. And you've got to take the lead and take the charge. And I've told my kids, and you tell yours, when you get out on your own and you can pay the bills and you don't need me, you make all the rules. Go ahead. But as long as I'm paying for the phone, as long as I'm paying for the food, as long as I'm paying for the bed and the house in which it sits, as long as I'm paying for the gas and the insurance, as long as I'm paying for the, all that stuff, you will do whatever it is that I say. All the way down the line. And you can complain to all your friends about it. If your kids don't hate you once in a while, you're not doing a good job. There it is. So here's something very quick that we can all do. 1 Peter 5th chapter tells us about the devil. He walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Do you know what he says about that first? He says, be sober and be vigilant. What the world is doing is it's intoxicating us. We have this pleasant feeling of drunkenness where we're sort of out of it because we're so distracted all the time by all the stuff the world throws at us and it's kind of fun, it's kind of pleasant, we're just kind of oblivious. It's a whole lot like being drunk. We're just kind of... This is fun, and that's interesting, and this is over here. Woo! My head's kind of spinning. And that's what the world wants. They want you to stay in that sort of oblivious state. And he says what you've got to do is sober up. You've got to stop taking in whatever the world's selling and sober up. So it's a two-part solution. First of all, you've got to tame the physical. Whatever the input that the world is having into your life, limit that. It may be social media, it may be movies or TV, or it may be conversations with worldly people. You need to put a cap on that, limit that, so that you're not getting so much of that. And secondly, you've got to retune your receiver. Because what you're doing is you're picking up on a signal that the world's broadcasting on. What you've got to do is pick up on the signal that God broadcasts from. And this is where you find it. Philippians, the fourth chapter. <clears throat> I'll say this, and then we'll just have the lesson be yours. Philippians 4, beginning in verse 8, and finishing with verse 8. Finally, brethren, aren't you glad to hear that? Aren't you always glad to hear that when a preacher says the word finally? Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. You know what the word meditate means? It's the Greek word logisimai. It's where we get the word logic from. It means very literally to give your mind entirely over to these things. You've got to change what it is that's coming in and change what it is that you're looking for. I know that LeBron James and some of these other guys are just phenomenal athletes. I know that some of these people who are in the music world are just tremendous talents in the things that they do. I know that these actors and actresses are just really impressive in the way they can pretend to be other people. You're very convinced by that. I get that. But you've got to stop thinking of those people as heroes because none of them are going to help you get to heaven. 
I want you to start looking at the people in your life who are noble and virtuous, who do praiseworthy things. I want you to look to them. I want you to talk to them. I want you to ask them questions. I want you to interview them. And I want you to admire and esteem them and think about them and how you can become like them. And that will help you tremendously. Well, that's it. That's how you stay out of the pickling potion. That's how you keep from becoming a pickle. Does anybody want to be a pickle? A lot of fresh cucumbers here. Let's keep it that way. But it may be tonight that we found ourselves all together in a place where people are supportive and helpful. They love you. And there may be somebody in this group or that group or this group who realizes that they're outside of Christ. There is no future in that. Youth is no guarantee. We're not promised tomorrow. If you are not a Christian in the biblical sense, if you've not put Jesus on in baptism, tonight presents an opportunity for you to do that. If you don't understand that, it also presents an opportunity for you to come forward tonight and tell us that you don't understand that. We'll sit down and study with you. Ask Jerry. That's exactly what we'll do. We'll just sit down and talk about what the Bible says. And you will not be asked to believe anything that you can't read with your own eyes in your own Bible. All we want is for people to be saved. And if you aren't saved tonight, why don't you avail yourself of this opportunity while these people are here to embrace you and encourage that decision. While you're with people who are wanting to go to heaven, before you go back out into the world and are distracted from this decision, why don't you make that choice tonight? Let us help you. Let us encourage you. Why don't you come right now as we stand and say, Is it for me?